we identified not one, not two, not three, but four separate origin stories. And we're going to tell them all here. But I think there is something important to learn about what AWS is and about Amazon and about Amazon culture in all of these. So let's start with the first and most obviously untrue one, <laughs> which is ironically also the one that the layperson believes the most. Yes, because it's tempting. I mean, it's like an, oh, like it's too convenient. Yes. And that story is the excess capacity narrative. So the way this story goes is that right around this time, 2001, 2002, 2003, Amazon.com, the retail business, like all retail businesses in America, at least, is highly seasonal. They have huge spikes of traffic and demand in Q4 for the holiday shopping season. And that's when most of, maybe not most, but the largest share of any quarter revenue happens in Q4. So much so that for the first at least five years of the business, there was a rule in November and December that you could not commit new code to production. That's right. It was so all hands on deck that no new features were allowed unless it was a red flag bug fix. Oh, and we didn't talk about this in the Amazon.com episode, but for years and years and years, the executive team and the business side of the company and the engineers, everybody would go work in the warehouses in Q4. That or customer service. Oh, how times have changed. Can you imagine someone sitting down in day one North or Doppler being told that they have to go pick and pack for a while? I think for a while they continued to do it even when it wasn't necessary just as like a culture thing. But obviously those days are gone now. So the urban legend is that because of this dynamic, Amazon had this brilliant realization around that. And again, when they're trying to achieve profitability, that they had excess technical infrastructure capacity in their IT operations during quarters one through three. So they had to build out for the peak demand of Q4, all the traffic on the website, all the transactions happening. But the rest of the year, all that capacity was just sitting there. And so they decided, let's rent out that capacity to other developers. Brilliant, brilliant. We are going to turn a large expense line in the business into a revenue line. Magic. And of course, this falls down in two enormous places. One is if you've ever been inside a pre-cloud technology company, you know that... It doesn't work that way. Yeah, you can't just say like, oh, cool, like the servers aren't in use right now and there's nothing highly customized about these servers and they're not tightly coupled to our applications in any way. So we'll just make it so that anyone can very easily just run their applications on it. And there's enough security set up correctly so that anyone can just get access to our data center and the network hardware sort of understands how to serve other tenants other than us. None of that existed and none of that was true. So there's just no way you can be like, oh yeah, other companies just started using our infrastructure and it was pretty rip and replace. In a pre-cloud infrastructure world, you installed your software, your code base on your servers that you owned. The Amazon.com code base was literally installed on a bunch of boxes that they owned. You couldn't just rent out the capacity. Until 2000, they were servers from Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC. They were DEC Alpha servers. These were unbelievably high margin servers that you, I believe, leased from the manufacturer. It was the same business model that IBM had forever and Oracle has or had forever, where you get this highly bundled hardware, software, platform that you would use to run your applications. And they would make 80% gross margins on these things. There's this massive markup. They were monolithic. And to be honest, the thing that really changed all this was Linux. When Linux came out and you could do the stuff that you used to need Unix workstations for on an open source operating system, well, then everything changed because you can go buy a whole bunch of different hardware, put Linux on it, and then write your own applications. And so this laid the groundwork for maybe infrastructure doesn't have to be as insanely expensive and all the profit pools from all of this infrastructure don't have to be captured by, say, a DEC or an Oracle or an IBM. And this would lay the groundwork for a lot of things to come, including, frankly, just saving Amazon as a company. I mean, in 2000, they almost went out of business because they were so tight on cash and they were spending so much on infrastructure 
that this sort of move to the open source ecosystem and doing a massive rewrite of all of Amazon.com to run on Linux and run on these, they did this big deal with HP, run on HP servers. Right, rather than DEC. That, frankly, saved the company from a cost perspective during that really tight time. But that is not virtualized cloud servers. (laughs) That's not what we're talking about with (laughs) AWS. Here's the other reason why this excess capacity myth is a myth. How is Amazon supposed to serve their AWS customers if all of them are on excess capacity during Q4 at all? (laughs) Right. Like, let's say I'm Netflix and I just took a dependency and all of my streaming is happening on AWS. Is Amazon just going to tell me I can't do it during Q4 when they need the servers? It's ridiculous. (laughs) No holiday movies. Can't watch Die Hard at Christmas. Uh, So it is a very convenient narrative when someone's trying to solve the puzzle of how did this internet retailer turn into a real technology company? Oh, they had all these extra servers dispelled. So the best and final word on this that we have to put here, because it literally is from part of the horse's mouth itself, comes from Werner Vogel's, the, at the time, AWS CTO, now CTO of all of Amazon, who wrote flat out in a Quora post in 2011, quote, the excess capacity story is a myth. It was never a matter of selling excess capacity. Actually, within two months after launch, AWS would have already burned through the excess Amazon.com capacity. Amazon Web Services was always considered a business by itself with the expectation that it could even grow as big as the Amazon.com retail operation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe. The other interesting thing to point out is it doesn't give Amazon enough credit about their intentionality and strategy. It short sells Amazon. Yeah, they had this extra capacity, this cost center that they were using. Well, two things. One, technology was never a cost center for Amazon. They never looked at it like, oh, we have an IT department. They always thought about themselves as a technology company. So it was always thinking about, okay, in 18 months, Moore's Law is going to make it so we have twice as much compute. What crazy cool stuff can we do with that? They always looked at technology as an investment, not a cost center. And the other thing, to your point that it sells them short on, is as if this wasn't an intentional strategy. This was an incredibly intentional strategy in a brand new business school case study type laser focus on an emerging market that they had reason to believe that they could create. Okay, that's origin story number one. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Sit me down. Say it straight. Another story on the way. Who got the truth? Who got the truth now? Hmm.